this is Jason Burns and through the night I'll be doing some resources uh, for Christians and uh, those who are seeking and uh, these resources uh, will be uh, on YouTube for you to use and I hope they'll be a blessing to you so let's come before the Lord Lord we thank you uh, for your grace and we thank you for your love and father we pray that you will bless this catechism uh, for your glory and honor in your name amen okay this catechism um, was compiled by the great C H Spurgeon he writes I am persuaded that the use of a good catechism in all our families will be a great safeguard against the increasing errors of the times and therefore I have compiled this little manual from the Westminster Assemblies and Baptist Con Catechism for the use of my own church and congregation. Those who use it in their families or classes must labor to explain the sense, but the words should be carefully learned by heart, for they will be understood better as years pass. May the Lord bless my dear friends and their families evermore, is the prayer of their loving pastor, C. H. Spurgeon. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 Published about 14, October the 14th, 1855, when Spurgeon was 21 years old. Spurgeon preached sermon number 46 to several thousand who gathered to hear him at New Park Street Chapel. When the sermon was published, it contained an announcement of this catechism. The text that morning was, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Psalm 90 verse 1. So now I'm going to uh, start reading uh, the catechism. And um, I hope it's going to be a blessing to you. Question, what is the chief end of man? Answer, man's chief end is to glorify God. So let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. One Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God and to enjoy him forever what is the chief end of man man's chief end is to glorify god 1 corinthians 10:31 and to enjoy him forever psalms 73:25 psalm 73:25 we read Whom have I in heaven but thee and there is none upon the earth that I desire but thee and you can read Psalm 73 26 second question what rule has God given us to direct us how we may glorify him answer the word of God which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20 and are built upon the foundations of the apostles and prophets Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works Second question, what do the scriptures principally teach? Answer, the scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God. 
what duty God requires of man. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 13 Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. And you can also read Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13. Question 4. What is God? Answer. God is spirit. John 4 24. God is infinite. Job 11 7. God is eternal. Psalm 90 verse 2. 1 Timothy chapter 1 17. And unchanged. Changeable. James chapter 1 verse 17, in his being, Exodus 3.14, in his wisdom and power, Psalm 147 verse 5, holiness, Revelation 4.8, in his justice, goodness and truth, Exodus 34.6, Exodus 34.7. Let's turn to Exodus 34 verse 6. Exodus 34 And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God merciful and gracious, long suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will be no, by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, unto the third and to the fourth generation. Question 5. Are there more gods than one? Answer. There is but only one God. Deuteronomy 6.4 The living and true God. Jeremiah 10.10 10. Jeremiah 10.10 10. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God. As everlasting king, his wrath and earth shall tremble, the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. Question 6. How many persons are there in the Godhead? Answer. There are three persons in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and these three are one, the same in essence, equal in power and glory. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, Matthew 28, verse 19. If we turn to 1 John 5, 7. 1 John 5 7 these three that bear record in heaven the Father the Word and the Holy Ghost and these three are one just a parenthesis here it's not in Spurgeon's catechism but I want to give a parenthesis uh, modern textual criticism will say that 1 John 5 7 is not in the uh, Bible that uh, ancient Greek manuscripts uh, will show that 1 John 5 7 is not in there now I've been recent researching this and um, I'm going to tell you that modern scholarship is wrong in this area it's very complex to tell you why that is but there are two schools of um, there are two schools of textual criticism that a lot of people don't know about there is the modern textual school of criti textual criticism that comes from the Alexandrian text uh, line. Um, so the vast majority of scholars prefer that line of uh, ancient manuscripts because the argument goes that they're older. But there is another line, the Byzantine line, and that goes actually back to Lucian, an early church father of the uh, 3rd century. And what I would want to say is that 1 John 5 7 is definitely in the line the Byzantine line and can be traced back even to the early times of the Apostles so when you hear textual criticism by modern scholars be very very wary and um, type in Dr. Scrivener he, he was a textual critic of a hundred years ago uh, a world authority in his time and he'll give you a different perspective than modern scholarship today. That's an aside uh, for anyone who wanted to know about 1 John 5 7. Question 7. What are the decrees of God? Answer. The decrees of God are his eternal purpose according to the counsel of his own will 
whereby for his own glory he has foreordained whatever comes to pass. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11 in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will and Ephesians chapter 1 verse 12 how does God execute his decrees God executes his decrees in those of creation Revelation 4:11 and providence providence Daniel 4:35 Question 9. What is the work of creation? The work of creation is God's making all things, Genesis 1 1, of nothing, by the word of his power, Hebrews 11 3, in six normal consecutive days, Exodus 20 11, and all very God, Genesis 1 31. Question. How did God create man? Answer. God created man male and female after his own image, Genesis 1 27, in knowledge, righteousness and holiness Colossians 3.10 Ephesians 4.24 with dominion over the creatures Genesis chapter 1.28 Question 11 What are God's works of providence? God's works of providence are his most holy Psalm 1.5.45.7 Wise Isaiah 28.29 and 4 Hebrews 1.3 Preserving and governing all his creatures and all their actions Psalm 103 verse 19 and Matthew 10 29 so let's turn to Psalm 103 verse 19 Psalm 103 verse 19 the Lord have prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom ruleth over all. Question 12. What special acts of providence did God exercise towards man in the state wherein he was created? Answer. When God had created man, he entered into a covenant of life with him upon condition of perfect obedience. Galatians 3.12 Forbidding him to eat of the tree knowledge of good and evil upon pain of death. Genesis 2.17 Question 13. Did our first parents continue in the state wherein they were created? Answer. Our first pa parents, being left to the freedom of their own will, fell from the state wherein they were created by sinning against God. Ecclesiastes 7.29 By eating the forbidden fruit. Genesis 3, chapter 3, verse 6 and 8. Question. What is sin? Answer. Sin is any want of conformity or transgression of the law of God. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 3 verse 4. 1 John chapter 3 verse 4. Whoever committed sin transgresseth, transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Question 15. Did all mankind fall in Adam's first transgression? Answer. The covenant being made with Adam not only for himself, but for his posterity. All mankind, descending from him by ordinary generation, sinned in him and fell with him in his first transgression. 1 Corinthians 15.22, Romans 5.12. Question 16. In what estate did the fall bring mankind? The fall brought mankind into a state of sin and misery. Romans 5.18 Question 17. Wherein consists the sinfulness of the state wherein man fell? Answer. The sinfulness of that state wherein man fell consists in the guilt of Adam for sin. Romans 5.19 The want of original righteousness. Romans 3.10 And the corruption of his whole nature which is commonly called original sin. Ephesians 2, chapter 2 verse 1, Psalm 51 verse 5, together with all the actual transgressions which proceed from it. Matthew 15, 19. Question 18. What is the misery of that estate, estate wherein man fell? Answer. 
all mankind by their fall lost communion with God. Genesis 3.8, Genesis 3.24 are under his wrath and curse. Ephesians 2 verse 3, Galatians 3.10 and so are made liable to all the miseries in this life, to death itself, and to the pains of hell forever. Romans 6.23, Matthew 25.41 Question 19. Did God leave all mankind to perish in the state of sin and misery? Answer. God, having out of his good pleasure from all eternity, elected some to everlasting life, 2 Thessalonians 2.13, did enter into a covenant of grace to deliver them out of the state of sin, the misery and to bring them into state of salvation by a redeemer Romans 5 21 question 20 who is the redeemer of God's elect answer the only redeemer of God's elect is the Lord Jesus Christ 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 who being the eternal son of God became man John chapter 1 verse 14 and so was and continues to be God and man in two distinct natures and one person forever 1 Timothy 3 16 and Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 question how did Christ being the Son of God become man answer Christ the Son of God became man by taking to himself true body Hebrews 2 14 and a reasonable soul Matthew 26 38 Hebrews 4 15 being conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and born of her Luke 31 and Luke chapter 1 35 yet without sin Hebrews 7 26 Question. What offices does Christ execute as our Redeemer? Answer. Christ as our Redeemer executes the office of prophet, Acts 3.22, of priest, Hebrews 5.6, and of a king, Psalm 2.6, both in his state of humiliation and exaltation. Question 23. How does Christ execute the office of a prophet? Answer. Christ executes the office of a prophet in revealing to us John 1.18 by his word John 20:31 and spirit John 14:26 the will of God for our salvation question 10 to 24 how does Christ execute the office of a priest answer Christ executes the office of a priest in his once offering up himself a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice Hebrews chapter 9:28 and to reconcile us to God Hebrews chapter 2 verse 17 and in making continued intercession for us, Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. Question. How does Christ execute the office of a king? Answer. Christ executes the office of a king in subduing us to himself. Psalm 110 verse 3. In ruling and defending us. Matthew chapter 2 verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 25. And in restraining and conquering all his and our enemies. Question 10, 26. Where did Christ's humiliation consist? Answer. Christ's humiliation consists in being born, and that in a low condition, Luke chapter 2, 7, made under the law, Galatians 4, 4, undergoing the miseries of this life, Isaiah 53, 3, the wrath of God, Matthew 27, 46, and the cursed death of the cross, Philippians 2, 8, and being buried and continuing under the power of death for a time, Matthew 12, 14. Question 27. Wherein consists Christ's exaltation? Answer. Christ's exaltation consists in his rising again from the dead on the third day. 1 Corinthians 15.4. In exanding up to, hev to heaven and sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Mark 16.19. And in coming to judge the world at the last day. Acts 17.31. Question. How, we, how, are we, how are we made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ? Answer, we are made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ by the effectual application of it to us. John chapter 1 verse 12 and by his Holy Spirit, Titus chapter 3 verse 5 and Titus chapter 3 verse 6. Question, how does the Spirit apply to us the redemption purchased by Christ? Answer, the Spirit applies to us the redemption purchased by Christ by working faith in us, Ephesians 2.8 and by it uniting us to Christ in our effectual calling, Ephesians 3.17. Question. What is effectual calling? Answer. Effectual calling is the work of God's Spirit, 2 Timothy 1.9, where convincing us of our sins and misery, Acts 2.37, 
enlightening our minds in the knowledge of Christ, Acts 26.18, and renewing our wills, Ezekiel 36.26. He does persuade and enable us to embrace Jesus Christ freely offered to us in the Gospel, John chapter 6, verse 44, and John chapter 6, 45. Let's turn to John chapter 6, 44. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me, and I will raise him up at the last day. So let's continue. What do benefits do they who are effectually called partake for in this life? They who are effectually called do in this life partake of justification, which is Romans 8.30, adoption, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5, sanctification and the various benefits which in this life do either accompany or flow from them 1 Corinthians 1 30 question what is justification justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all our sins Romans chapter 3 24 Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 and accepts us as a righteous in his sight 2 Corinthians 5 21 only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us Romans 519 and receive by faith alone Galatians chapter 2 verse 16 Philippians 3 9 question what is adoption adoption is an act of God's free grace 1 John 3 1 wherein we are received into the number and have a right to all the privileges of the sons of God John chapter 1 verse 12 Romans 8 17 what is sanctification question answer sanctification is the work of God's Spirit 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13 we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God, Ephesians 4.24, and are enabled more and more to die to sin and live righteousness, Romans 6.11. Question, what are the benefits which in this life do either accompany or flow from justification, adoption, and sanctification? Answer, the benefits which in this life do accompany or flow from justification, Romans 5, 1, Romans 5, 2, Romans 5. 5 are assurance of God's love, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Spirit, Romans 14, 17, increase of grace, perseverance to the end, Proverbs 4, 18, 1 John 5, 13, and 1 Peter 1, 5. Question, what benefits do believers receive from Christ and their death? The souls of believers are at their death made perfect in holiness, Hebrews 12, 23, and do immediately pass into glory, Ephesians, uh, Philippians 1, 23, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 8, Luke 23, 43, and their bodies being still united to Christ, 1 Thessalonians 4, 14, do rest in their graves, Isaiah 57, 2, 2 till the resurrection, Job 19, 26. What benefits do believers receive from Christ at the resurrection? At the resurrection, believers being raised up in glory, 1 Corinthians 15, 43, shall be openly acknowledged and acquitted in the day of judgment, Matthew 10, 13, 2, and made perfectly blessed both in soul and body in the full enjoyment of God, 1 John 3, 2, to all eternity, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Question. What shall be done to the wicked at their death? Answer. 
the souls of the wicked shall at their death be cast into the torments of hell. Luke 16, 22, 24, their bodies lie in their graves till the resurrection and judgment of the great day. Psalm 49, 14. Question 39. What shall be done to the wicked at the day of judgment? At the day of judgment, the bodies of the wicked being raised out of the graves shall be sentenced together with their souls to unspeakable torments with the devil and his angels forever. Daniel 12, verse 2. John 5, 28. John 5, 29. 2 Thessalonians 1, 9. Matthew chapter 25, 41. Question. What did God reveal to man for the rule of his obedience? Answer. The rule which God first revealed to man for his obedience is the law Deuteronomy 10.4 Matthew 19.17 which is summarized in the Ten Commandments what is the sum of the Ten Commandments answer the sum of the Ten Commandments is to love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul with all our strength and with all our mind and our neighbor as ourself Matthew 22.37 and 40 question which is the first commandment answer the first commandment thou shalt have no other gods before me what is required in the first commandment? The first commandment requires us to know 1 Chronicles 28 9 and acknowledge God to be the truly true God and our God, Deuteronomy 26 17, and to worship and glorify Him accordingly, Matthew 4 10, which is the second commandment. The second commandment is, Thou shalt make unto thee, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth thou shalt not bow thyself to them nor serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments question what is required in the second commandment answer the second commandment requires the receiving observing Deuteronomy 32 46 Matthew 28 20 and keeping pure and entire all such religious worship and ordinances as God has appointed in his word, Deuteronomy 12.32. Question, what is forbidden in the second commandment? Answer, the second commandment forbids the worshipping of God by images, Deuteronomy 4.15, Deuteronomy 4.16, or any other way not appointed in his word, Colossians 2.18. Which is the third commandment? The third commandment is, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold it loose and take his name in vain. What is required in the third commandment? The third commandment requires the holy reverent use of God's names. Psalm 29.2, titles and attributes, Revelation 15.3, Revelation 15.4, ordinances, Ecclesiastes 5.1, words, Psalm 13.8.2, and works, Job 36.24, Deuteronomy 28.58, Deuteronomy 28.59, which is the fourth commandment. The fourth commandment is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant or thy maidservant, nor thy cattle nor thy strangers with thee within the gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in this. Them is and rested the seventh day wherein the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Question, what is required in the fourth commandment? Answer, the fourth commandment requires the keeping holy to God such set times as he has appointed in his word expressly one whole day in seven to be a holy Sabbath to himself. Levit Leviticus 19.30, Deuteronomy 5.12. Question, how is the Sabbath to be sanctified? Answer, the Sabbath is to be sanctified by a holy resting all that day, even from such worldly employments and recreations as are lawful on their days. Leviticus 23.3 and spending a whole time in public and private exercise of God's worship Psalm 92 verse 1 Psalm 92 verse 2 Isaiah 58.13 Isaiah 58.14 except so much as is taken up in the works of necessity and mercy Matthew 12.11 Matthew 12.12 12. which is the fifth commandment answer the fifth commandment is honor thy father mother that thy days may bring upon the land which the Lord thy God give thee question what is required in the fifth commandment the fifth commandment requires the preserving the honor and performing the duties belonging to everyone in their various positions and relationships as superiors 
Ephesians 5.24, Ephesians 5.22, Ephesians 6.1, Ephesians 6.5, Romans 13.1, Inferiors, Ephesians 6.9, or equals Romans 12.10. What is the reason annexed to the command, fifth commandment? The reason annexed to the fifth commandment is a promise of a long life and prosperity as far as it shall serve for God's glory and their own good to all who such as keep his commandments. Ephesians 6.2, Ephesians 6.3. Question, which is the sixth commandment? The sixth commandment is thou shalt not kill. What is forbidden in the sixth commandment? The sixth commandment forbids the taking away of our own life. Acts 16.28 Or the life of our neighbor. Genesis 6.9.6 6, Or whatever tends to it. Proverbs 24.11 Proverbs 24.12 Which is the seventh commandment. The seventh commandment is thou shalt not commit adultery. What is forbidden in the commandment? The seventh commandment forbids all unchaste thoughts, Matthew 5.28, Colossians 4.6, words, Ephesians 5.4, 2 Timothy 2.22, 2, and actions, Ephesians 5.3, which is the eighth commandment. The eighth commandment is thou shalt not steal. What is forbidden in the eighth commandment? The eighth commandment forbids whatever does or may unjustly hinder our own. 1 Timothy 5.8, Proverbs 28.19, Proverbs 21.6, our neighbor's wealth or outward estate, Ephesians 4.28, which is the ninth commandment. The ninth commandment is thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Question, what is required in the ninth commandment? Answer, the ninth commandment requires the maintaining and promoting of truth between man and man, Zechariah 8.16, and of our own, 1 Peter 3.16, Acts 25.10, and our neighbor's good name, John 3. 3 John 1 12, especially in witness bearing, Proverbs 14 5, Proverbs 14 25. What is the tenth commandment? The tenth commandment is, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his maidservant, or maidservants, nor his ox, or his ass, nor anything that is, is thy neighbor's. Answer. Sorry, question. What is forbidden in the tenth commandment? Answer, the Tenth Commandment forbids all discontentment with our own estate. 1 Corinthians 10.10, 10, envying or greeting at the good of our neighbor, Galatians 5.26, and all inordinate emotion and affections to anything that is his, Colossians 3.5. Question, is any man able perfectly to keep the commandments of God? Answer, no mere man, since the fall is able, and is perfect, perfectly to keep the commandments of God. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 20. But does daily break them in thought? Genesis 8.21 Word, James 3.8 And deed, James 3.2 Question Are all transgressions of the law equals, equally bad? Answer Some sins in themselves and by reason of various aggravations are more bad in the sight of God than others. John 19.11 1 John 5.15 What does every sin deserve? Every sin deserves God's wrath and curse upon both in this life and that which is to come. Ephesians 5, 6, Psalm 11, 6. Question, how may we escape his wrath and curse due to us for his sin? Uh, for, for sin. Answer, to escape the wrath and curse of God due to us for sin, we must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. John 3, 16. alone to his blood and righteousness. This faith is attended by the repentance of the past. Acts chapter 20, verse 21 and leads to holiness in the future. What is faith in Jesus Christ? Answer, faith in Jesus Christ is saving grace, Hebrews 10.39, whereby we receive John 1.12 and rest upon him alone for salvation, Philippians 3.9, as he is set forth in the gospel, Isaiah 33.22. What is repentance to life? Answer, repentance to life is saving grace, Acts chapter 11, verse 18, where a sinner out of a true sense of his sins Acts chapter 2.37, and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, Joel chapter 2.13, does with grief and hatred of sin turn to, from it to God, Jeremiah 31.18, Jeremiah 31.19, with full purpose to strive after new obedience, Psalm 119.59. What are the outward means where the Holy Spirit communicates to us the benefits of redemption? <clears throat> The outward and ordinary means wherein the Holy Spirit communicates to us the benefits of Christ's redemption are the Word, 
by which souls are begotten to spiritual life, baptism, the Lord's Supper, prayer, meditation, by all which believers are further edified in their most holy faith. Acts chapter 2, 41. Acts chapter 2, 42. James chapter 1, 18. Question. How is the word made effectual to salvation? Answer. The Spirit of God makes the reading, but especially the preaching of the word, an effectual means of convincing and converting sinners. Psalm 19, 7 and of her building them up in holiness and comfort, 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, through faith to salvation, Romans 1, 16. Question. How is the word to be read and heard, that it may become effectual to salvation? Answer. That the word may become effectual to salvation, we must attend to it with diligence, Proverbs 8, 30, preparation, 1 Peter 2, 1, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, and prayer, Psalm 119, verse 18. Receive it with faith, Hebrews 4.2, and love, 2 Thessalonians 2.10. Lay it up in our hearts, Psalm 119.11, and practice it in our lives, James 1.25. Question. How do baptism and the Lord's Supper become spiritually helpful? Answer. Baptism and the Lord's Supper become spiritually helpful, not from any virtue in them, nor in him who does administer them. 1 Corinthians 3.7, 1 Peter 3.21. But only by the blessings of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, and the working of the Spirit in those who by faith receive them, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. What is baptism? Baptism is an ordinance of the New Testament instituted by Jesus Christ, Matthew 28, 19. To be the person baptized to size fellowship with him. In his death and burial and resurrection, Romans 6, 3, Colossians chapter 2, 12. Of his being engrafted into him, Galatians 3.27. Of remission of sins, Mark 1.4, Acts 22.16. And of his giving up himself to God through Jesus Christ to live and walk in newness of life, Romans 6.4, Romans 6.5. Question, to whom is baptism to be administered? Baptism is to be administered to all those who actually profess repentance towards God. Acts 2.38, Matthew 3.6, Mark 16.16. .16. Acts 8.12, Acts 8.36, Acts 8.37, Acts 10.47, Acts 10.48, and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and to none other. Question. Are the infants of such are professing to be baptized? The infants of such are professing believers are not to be baptized because there is neither command nor example in the Holy Scripture of their baptism. Exodus 23.13, Proverbs 6. Question. How is baptism rightly administered? Baptism is rightly administered by immersion or dipping the whole body of the person in water, Matthew 3.16, John 3.23, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, according to Christ's institution and the practice of the apostles, Matthew 28.19, Matthew 28.20, 20, and not by sprinkling or pouring of water or dipping some part of the body after the tradition of men, John 4.1, John 4.2, Acts 8.38, Acts 8.39. Question, what is the duty of such as are rightly baptized? It is the duty of such as are rightly baptized to give up themselves to some particular and orderly church of Jesus Christ, Acts 2.47, Acts 9.26, 1 Peter 2.5, that they may walk in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless, Luke 1.6. What is the Lord's Supper? The Lord's Supper is an ordinance of the New Testament instituted by Jesus Christ, wherein by giving and receiving bread and wine according to his appointment, his death is shown forth. 1 Corinthians 11:23 to 26. And the worthy receivers are not after corporal and carnal manner, but by faith made partakers of his body and blood, with all his benefits to their spiritual nourishment and growth. 1 Corinthians 10:16. What is required to the worthy receiving of the Lord's Supper? It is required of them who would worthily partake of the Lord's Supper that they examine themselves of their knowledge to discern the Lord's body. 1 Corinthians 11.28 1 Corinthians 11.29 Of their faith to feed upon him. 2 Corinthians 13.5 Of their repentance. 1 Corinthians 13.31 Love. 1 Corinthians 11.18.20 And new obedience. 1 Corinthians 5.8 Lest coming unworthily they eat and drink judgment to themselves. 1 Corinthians 11.27.29 question what is meant by the words until he come which are used by the apostle paul in reference to the lord's supper answer they plainly teach us that our lord jesus christ will come a second time 
which is the joy and hope of all believers. Acts chapter 1 verse 11, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16. So we have come to the end of a Puritan Catechism and I hope that has been a blessing to you. Look up the references that I have given you and study uh, the Catechism and it will strengthen your faith and encourage you in your walk with the Lord. May God bless you today and I'll just pray that the Lord will bless. Father God we thank you for these biblical truths that we have learned from Charles Spurgeon's Catechism built on the Puritan theology from the Word of God. Father we thank you for the great heritage that we have and I pray O oh God that you will bless this Catechism to people that it would be an encouragement to them in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. If you want to make a copy of this catechism and send it to people um, of this video, feel free. May God bless you.